Welcome to the Triage Method Podcast with me, Gary McGowan, and my co-host, Mr. Patrick Farrell. This is the Thursday episode, as you know, and what that means is that we're going to be answering a short question. Before we do get stuck in, just to remind you that we do have online coaching spaces available at the moment. Um, I don't think we're good enough at letting people know this, which is why we're starting to do it at the start of the podcast, because sometimes we get messages and it's like, hey, you guys accepting clients or are you full or when can I sign up? And it's like, oh, actually, well, we actually have space available. No, the worst the worst is when someone finds out after following us for like three years and they're like, oh, you do online coaching? Oh, I'd love to work with you. And I'm like, well, we are obviously shit. I mean shit at marketing ourselves. But anyway, yeah, there's spaces available for all that stuff. Link is below or above or wherever the fuck you're listening to this. It's, it's somewhere, right? Uh, or you can just find it on our website. Right, so let's get stuck in. The, the question today it's it's a it's a question we got in via the email and i'm just going to summarize it because i'm not going to read out the entire email right and as i said before and i always say to this if you do have questions there is a form below that you can submit your questions you can ask us on social media you can ask us via email you know the easiest one is just to submit that form because that's where we would ideally like to just aggregate everything right because if you ask us a question on social media like my instagram gary's instagram you know, uh, the, the triage Instagram, anything like that, like it can get lost in the whole whatever, you know? And um, so if you could just ask by the form, that would really help. Anyway, let's, let's get into the actual question. And I'm just going to summarize it here. Effectively, there was a study that came out recently on, you know, hip thrusts and squats. And this caused this whole ripple through the, the health and fitness industry. And people were going wild over it and whatever else. And you can clearly see that, First of all, loads of people had not read the actual study. And second of all, you could also see that people have some sort of, I don't know, religion-shaped hole in their heart or something. Because as soon as it attacked or seemed to attack one of their kind of central dogmas, uh, it, it really caused people to react in a negative way and like be very hyperbolic in their critique of the study and their... I don't know what you would call them, their, their programs, their methods, whatever. They're like, this, this is the only way you should do it, that kind of stuff, right? And at the end of the day, it, it's some, somewhat irrelevant. But anyway, the, the question effectively was, and it was because of this study, you know, should I do hip thrusts or should I do squats if I want to grow my glutes, right? And again, it was a few paragraphs on it, giving some rationale, their background, all that kind of stuff. But it's irregardless to this actual question because that's essentially the the crux of the issue. Should I do hip thrusts or should I do squats for glute growth, right? So if you're trying to grow your glutes specifically, which should you do, right? And obviously you can see there is potentially a few issues with that thought process. But Gary, take it away from here. What's the story? Hip thrusts or squats for glutes or is there more to it? <coughs> this is the... I think this study and the, the reaction to it, like I didn't actually really re- read any of the hot takes that people had or the articles that came on afterwards or discussions because I just read the study and I'm like, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, that's sort of, you know, that's interesting, but I'm still going to, you know, think about how, how, how does this differ from real, real world application and is this going to actually change my practice? No, it's not because, right? If you, Firstly, what you have to do, when you read any study, you have to put it in the con- put it in its own context, and then consider how that relates to the real world action. And the thing with this study is, I'm not actually critiquing the study and saying that you shouldn't take the results from this because I think a lot of people have done that, and like that's not what I'm interested in. But basically, this was a study where the intervention was designed so that the the one group performs six sets of squats and one group perform six sets of hip thrusts and they did that once per week now if there was a, a study that said um one group uh, ate uh, one meal of steak per day and one group ate one meal of oatmeal per day like you would not just take the results from that study to conclude that oatmeal is better than why must oatmeal I'm american porridge porridge is better than steak or that steak is better than porridge for <laughs> sort of outcome why 
because why on earth would you only eat steak or porridge? Like, why would you not eat both? Like, obviously, I know there's there's carnivore people, let them do their thing. But none of us are just going to make a decision based on an isolated food group and say, all right, I'm just, I'm just going to eat that now. So it seems to be the best thing. And this is the a similar case here with exercise, right? I've got programs in which someone has the, the goal to develop their glutes to increase the strength or hypertrophy or whatever, but they're almost always are there together in some capacity. And that's the same for the chest, it's the same for the back, it's the same for any part of the body because exercises should always be viewed in terms of like how do they complement each other to create the, a, a program as a whole. But what might be interesting would be like an, a study, let's say, where they said, Oh, let's see what happens when you get a group to do right there. If they're doing 10, if they're doing 20 a week, is there a difference between them doing 20 sets of all squats or like 15 sets of squats and five sets of hip thrusts or something along those lines? And then you might want to subgroup that into different individuals who have different goals or different experiences in the gym or whatever. And this is where your reasoning as a coach starts to, starts to come into play because the context in which I might include a hip thrust into a program for someone would be all right it's it's probably not practical for us to continue doing more squatting but we want to increase our hip extents hip extent strength or hypertrophy without additional kind of loading of the lower back because they might be fatigued um, and also in a different range of motion than will be trained in other exercises and there's a sort of complementary effect okay with the goal with research is not to find the golden exercise like we know that like deadlift and squat variations are fantastic for multiple goals but it doesn't mean that you only do them, you know? Clearly, if you were to take a study that designed, or that was designed to test, let's say, a leg curl versus a deadlift, yeah, you could call both of those hamstring exercises, but any coach that actually has their head in the real world knows that, like, you don't just do deadlifts because you just want to, you know, increase knee flexor strength, or you want to just increase your hamstring size. It's like, that's not the only reason. Everyone appreciates that there are additional benefits to an exercise like that because there's lots of muscles involved and there's a strength component that might carry over into some tasks that we do in the real world, etc. So I think I think it's actually more likely that a, a more scientifically minded person could misinterpret this study more than your actual average personal trainer. Because any personal trainer that's on the floor coaching clients, writing programs, knows that you don't just choose one exercise. That's not how it works. So I suppose to kind of get into the, the specifics of like what you would be thinking about when it comes to a squat versus a hip thrust when you're looking at something like a squat the the main like qualities there in terms of training the glutes the the greatest challenge is going to be when the glutes are in a more lengthened position okay so at the bottom or as you come towards the bottom the lift is going to be more challenging it's going to be an increase in moment arm to the hip increase in challenge on the hip extensors and those hip extensors particularly the glutes are in a more lengthened position there okay so that is the different stimulus to a stimulus applied in the hip thrust whereby lunge is greatest at the top when the glutes are in a more shortened position okay so there are different aspects to that exercise they're they're fundamentally different there's a difference in the you could say there's a difference in the way that the the force vector is applied if you want to think of it in terms of that but really you're thinking about okay these two exercises are different they train the muscles at a different point in the range of motion that other muscles contribute to the exercise is different as well. You know, one of the points that, that Paddy brought up before this episode was that you would have, you know, a someone who has low upper body strength, let's say, that limits their squat, or maybe they've got they've had some some lower back pain, or they struggle with their back being the limiting factor during a squat. And if that's going to be the limiting factor to their performance, then something like a hip thrust might be a a good thing to include there. It doesn't mean that you say. Ha, no squats, no leg presses, just hip thrust because nobody does that. But you actually start to make some some reasoning um, as to why you might shift more of your bias towards another exercise. And like this isn't just a squat versus hip thrust question. It also extends to other maybe glute specific exercises that you might be considering. Like maybe you want to add in some seated hip abductions. Maybe you want to add in a machine hip extension. Um, these are the reason we record podcasts and we kind of talk about things generally is that we want you to be able to put these things in context because that's often not what people do when they read research and they just see this kind of title and it's like, oh, squats are better than hips. 
better tag Brett Contreras and tell him he's an idiot because he's wrong. Like that's just not a helpful way of going about things, you know? Instead, we want to keep it in context, think about how this applies in the real world. And while there's something useful um, to take away from the fact that, okay, in this study with these constraints, squats led to um, more overall muscle growth and more glute hypertrophy than a hip thrust, you know, that might actually tell you that if I was to pick one lower body exercise for lower body strength and for building up my thighs and my glutes, yeah, squats are probably better. But I think like the vast majority of trainers on any gym floor could probably tell you that anyway, you know? Yeah, like I, I think this is the major thing you need to take away from this whole discussion. Well, any of these hot takes that you read, any of these whatever, it's effectively like there, it, nowhere in the real world are people programming squats or hip thrusts. Like I, I've never seen that in practice. And like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't mean to say I've never seen that in practice. I mean like, yeah, there's definitely stages or periods where people are like, oh yeah, I'm going to bias more towards this exercise because of whatever X, Y, and Z reason. But generally you'll have some other exercises in there and you'll have someone that has been squatting, building up strength in the squat for years, weeks, months, whatever. Um, so it's not really a, a fair comparison ever. And it also just doesn't happen in the real world. So if you are looking to change your programming because you're like, oh, squats, I was doing a lot of hip thrusts, forget about them. They're not as effective as squats. I'm like, again, like Ari said, there are certain populations there are certain periods of time there are certain reasons that you would be like okay i actually want to include some hip thrusts in here and like Ari said earlier on there they're like for a lot of populations the thing that becomes limiting in their squat performance is upper body strength and i mean this for women in particular you know like a lot of women struggle with progressing their squat and it's not because their legs aren't strong enough it's because there's something else in this whole chain that isn't strong enough to progress that squat. Now, you can argue and just go, oh, well, just you know, progressively overload it and you know, take your time with it, it'll come. And it's like, yeah, that, that's perfectly true. But now your glutes are always at a lower relative intensity. They're, they're never working to their max because you are limited by something else. You know, like if, if I was like, oh, chin ups are the best back exercise, and every single time you did chin ups, your biceps failed. Like they're the ones that you only ever felt in your bicep. You couldn't progress because your arms aren't strong enough. And my only solution to that is, well, just do more chin ups. Like it's stupid. You know, it, that doesn't help the individual, you know? So if you can go, okay, your back now isn't getting trained enough because we aren't training it, let's bring in a lap pull down or some, some other variation, some other row, whatever. So we're still training those muscles while you are also training these weak link muscles while you're also training this like there's there's never any oh it's either or or you can't do that or you can't progress that it's gone see you later never doing it again you know like that's that's not helpful now there are certain situations where you might go okay so this client has come to me they want to build their glutes right but they already have very well developed quads you know you might go to them and be like okay you don't want to really build your quads up anymore the way you've been training your glutes previous to this has been effectively training your quads just a little bit too much for your given goals, you know? And a lot of women will find that, that they're like, my quads respond quite well, but you know, I don't actually want them any bigger. They're, they're like, Oh, I want that kind of toned, lean, long leg look, you know, whatever buzzwords they're, they're fed, you know, but that's the, that's the look. We all know what look they're looking for, that they're, they're saying they're looking for. And you can produce that in the gym, you know? But you might go, the only way I know to train my glutes is to squat and it's building my legs too much. Then you might go, okay, so we're still going to keep some squatting in here. So we still, you know, progressively overload that movement. The quads are still getting some work or maybe you're like, okay, we're going to bring that. We're just going to, for this entire block, we're just not going to touch on the quads, you know, that again, possible. But you say, we're just going to keep it in here because it still effectively trains the glutes. It still effectively trains the quads. So let's do the minimum effective dose on that. And then let's go move on to some more glute specific work because that's the area you actually want to build up. You know, you've been training it and your glutes are lacking and your quads are not lacking, you know? So you're like, okay, now there's, there, here's an issue where if you've been following the, the research, you kind of go, oh yeah, but squats are the best way to train your glutes. So we're just going to squat. Forget about the hip thrust. It's a, it's a, a lower level. It, it's, it's not as good as squats for building the glutes but you have an individual in front of you who has been squatting and their quads are growing, but their glutes aren't growing. Right. Or they're, they're not growing. The two of those are not growing at the rates that they want them to grow at. Right. And then all of a sudden it becomes, 
okay, so what tools do I have in my toolbox so that I can target the glutes specifically and not get this other outcome of quad growth? Now, there is a bit of an issue here because you do have that what's called Lombard's paradox where you know the quads are effectively working as a, a hip extensor as well. So the quads will still be stimulated in something like a, a hip thrust. And you, again, you anecdotally, you see this people saying it, they're like, oh, I feel, feel the hip thrust in my quads. Like, again, it, there, there, there is a reason for that, you know? But uh, you, can, you can essentially, again, bias the tension where you want it. Like, again, like you, this is the exact same thought process you would have if someone came to you and they're like, yeah, my chest is great, really great. Fucking every pressing movement I do, you know, builds my chest, but my shoulders are shit, you know? Like, you wouldn't just go, oh, well, we know, you know, the bench press, it trains the anterior delts, so it's the best exercise for that. We're just never going to look at any other exercise. You're going to be like, okay, let's, let's see if we can do some other movements for the area that is lacking. Your chest is great. Let's bring that down. Let's bring the volume of work we're doing on that down to, you know, be at this kind of gaintenance uh, period of training where it's like, yeah, if we get any gains on that, great. But really, we're just trying to far target these other areas, you know? Like, as we've said before, like, you don't need to follow a specific program for someone else. You need to follow a specific program for you. Like, if you have lagging body parts, if you have uh, areas that you want to build up, you know, there's a physique, a look that you have in your mind that you're like, that's what I want to grow towards, then you allocate, a vol you allocate volume accordingly to achieve that look, you know? And again, that comes back down to this issue if you're like, oh, squats or hip thrusts. For the population that you're speaking to, for the individuals that you're speaking to, hip thrusts could be a better exercise. Squats could be a better exercise. That doesn't mean that you do either or, you know? You can still do both, you know, in your program. And again, it comes back to like the stuff that we've talked about before and Gary touched on there as well, where like we're, we're effectively training in different ranges here. We're training in different portions of the, the, the strength profile of that muscle, you know? So like, I don't understand why people say things in the physique world, the health and fitness world, whatever the fuck world you want to call this, where they'll say, oh, we need to do X, Y, and Z exercise to target all these different muscle groups, you know? Like you need to do like, oh, I don't know, toes pointing in, uh, quad extensions to target the vastus lateralis or whatever fucking stuff they talk about and then all of a sudden a study like this comes out and they still have all these thoughts and then they're like oh well i have to do this i can only do squats now glutes hip thrusts are, are irrelevant you know so it, it, there, there's a dichotomy there in their their thought process where it's not these things don't glue together you're doing five different exercises for your chest uh, to, to grow it and you're like oh I have to get into a stretch range I have to get a, an upper or a, an incline and a decline and a, a flat and I, you have to get all these different things to target every fucking muscle fiber of your chest and then it's like oh well this, this they said this exercise is better than this exercise so I'm going to only do this exercise you know and, and effectively it's just people confirming their biases they're built to squat and they're like yeah I got great results from this and in fairness like I could I could literally say this anecdotally this is unreal i found this exactly the exact same thing like squats did nothing for my quad growth right but my ass just got fucking huge from squats now again i am like over six foot five so my squats even a high bar squat kind of looks like a a low bar squat but irregardless uh, that's you know you can see why it was great for glute growth right and again we don't have any videos of these people doing the exercises in this study you know so i'm like for all I know, all of these people squatted in a manner that was all glutes, you know? <laughs> like, we just don't know, you know? Um, so when you're looking at the, these kind of questions, like, you just have to bring it back to the first, prin first principles. Like, what are we actually trying to do? We're trying to provide tension to a muscle to get a, an outcome, whether that's strength, you know, muscle building, or whatever. The actual tools you use should be specific to the individual, you know? Like, if they say, I don't want any quads, my quads are big enough. You're like, okay, well, what tools do I have in my toolbox that can achieve that? You're like, hip thrusts. Yeah, there's a bit of quad stimulation, but it's lower than you would get with squats, you know? Or again, vice versa, you're just like, yeah, your lower body as a whole needs to grow. It's like, well, like we know squats are probably pretty good for that as a whole. And oh, we have this little bit of research here that says, you know, squats are good for glutes as well. Like, unreal. So let's train them, you know, let's progressively overload them. But then you start running into problems, certain populations, certain people, they're like, yeah, like I can't progress my squats anymore. You know, they're not maybe perfectly built for squats. And if you're just like, well, squats are the best, 
like you've just failed that population. You've just failed that in the individual. And just because you don't have tools in your toolbox or you refuse to acknowledge that there are tools in your toolbox that can help that population, you know? Yep. I don't think I've much else to, to say on that. The only thing I would, I would add is that just if you are a trainer listening to this and you're like, oh damn, you know, I got, I got duped by those, those headlines. This always happens to me. Like, go back and kind of review your knowledge of like, you know, these kind of first principles, like we're not all about like just taking everything from first principles and never taking empirical evidence. Like that's not what it's about, but you should be able to kind of come back to your basic reasoning in terms of your knowledge of, right. How do I, do I understand anatomy? Do I understand the basics of, of exercise mechanics? Like if there's a challenge at the knee or a challenge at the hip, do I know where that's coming from? You know, cause like that, they're the basics of understanding exercise. You know, do you understand, the length tension relationship in terms of uh, like a basic, basic muscle physiology, you know, your energy systems, all these, these really basic things that when you kind of learn them initially, I think a lot of people like when they become personal trainers, or even if you're studying, you know, exercise science or, or whatever, you might come across them in medicine or physio or any of these things that you kind of skim over, you think, oh yeah, that's not really, you know, that's not really important. That's just kind of mechanistic stuff. Don't really need to know that. It does actually help to, support your reasoning like because you you'll you will have these findings and then you th you think oh yeah that kind of that kind of makes sense you know that kind of there's something about that that is qualitatively different to between x and y between the hip thrust and the squat because you have that first principles knowledge you know exactly how those exercises are different um and then of course you you have to zoom out too and you have to ask yourself how does all this apply in the real world and if you're looking at a study that has six sets once a week of one exercise versus six sets once a week of another exercise you know that there might be something something interesting to take away from that, but you don't program like that anyway. So, you know, you have to, to put it in context. So I don't have anything else to add, Patty. I just have a few things, but just just on that, like this, this is one of those things as well. Like you don't need, to, like even we're saying like, go back and learn first principles. Like you don't even need to do that. You just need to actually understand your reasoning for the thoughts that you have. For example, like you will say, something i don't know you look at like effectively why would you why do you want like why would you when you look at someone do an exercise like why do you want it to look a certain way right and once you start questioning yourself on that you're like okay the reason i want it to look that way is because it puts tension where i want it you know you want this like we'll say a squat to be this like upright high bar type squat and you're like that's because that puts tension where I want it, you know? And if you see like, okay, someone's doing this kind of good morning squat, like, why do you not want that? You're like, oh, because it puts tension where I don't want it. So even just like very basically, like just like looking at someone and then questioning your thoughts as to the reasoning why you want something to go a certain way, you can start going, okay, so now I'm actually understanding these first principles without actually, you know, learning these first principles, you know? So it doesn't need to be like a, we'll call it academic that you need to go back and read all this stuff that you're supposed to know or whatever. Like you just need to question your thoughts and your reasoning as to why you look at exercise a certain way, you know? And, but yeah, to, to kind of wrap this up because I want, I want to actually answer the question, you know, which your question is like, should I do hip thrusts or squats? Right. And the way you answer this effectively is forget the two polarized people, people that are like, hip thrust is the be all and end all, right? Mm -hmm. And forget the squats are the be all and end all. And realize that if you're a personal trainer or if you are an individual training yourself, you need to be clear in your actual goals, right? And once you're clear in your actual goals, then you can start making better exercise choices, right? Because if you're saying, like we said earlier on, you don't want to build your quads or you see that you want to build your lower body but your upper body is limited in its strength capacity. Again, like you're a smaller female and perhaps you don't want to build a, a bigger upper body that would be able to support stronger or heavier uh, lower body loading, right? But all that kind of stuff then just informs how you actually program for that individual or for yourself, you know? But it all starts with you being very clear with your goals, right? So if you're saying, again, this, the question here is, which one should I do for glute growth, right? And effectively, the answer is both, you know, perhaps at different times, perhaps together in the same program, perhaps you bias one over the other, you know, but effectively, there's no reason to be one or the other. Again, maybe squats are just not 
you're not built for them, then don't do them. Like, yeah, you might go, we have this research to show that they are a better uh, glute building exercise. But if you're not built for them, you're not actually able to execute them in a manner that grows your glutes, then they're, they're not the best exercise for you. You know, if you have been stuck at 40 kilos on your squat for the last eight years because every time you try to go above that you're just your upper body is limited or you know you tip forward your technique goes to shit whatever you know you're not able to hit depth you're just not built for squatting then if that's not going to lead to the best glute growth for you you know whereas you're like oh i do a hip thrust and i'm actually able to progressively overload this i'm actually able to see myself get stronger over time i'm up to 200 kilos on that and i'm like that's going to be the thing that grows your glutes the best, right? Because you're actually able to progressively overload it because you're actually, actually able to execute it efficiently. You know, that doesn't mean that you'd go, I'm never going to train this squat pattern. You still can look for exercises that allow you to train that squat pattern in a manner that allows you to progressively overload it. Again, like maybe you change something like a front squat and you think like, Oh, my lower body or my upper body was limiting. But now that I'm actually in this more upright position, like my low back, it's all the tension is gone off that, or not all the tension, but there's reduced tension there. There's reduced, you know, actual pressure on that. And all of a sudden I'm actually able to progress this front squat or it's a safety bar squat or it's a, a hack squat or it's a leg press or whatever. And you're like, I'm actually still, I'm actually able to progress this in a manner that I wanted to progress. And wow, you start getting results, you know? So all you need to do when you're looking for an exercise is identify your goal, your specific goal, you know, identify any limiting factors to you achieving that goal. Again, like we said, like maybe your upper body strength or something like that, and then choose exercises that allow you to achieve that goal. There's no or either or, especially when we're talking about something, uh, two exercises that effectively train multiple muscles. Like why are we just isolating one muscle? I mean, like, oh, this is the thing, I, especially because in this argument, the squat is a very multi-joint, multi-muscle movement, and the hip thrust is more of an isolation movement. But that doesn't mean that that you would choose one or the other. You know, like we, it's not really comparing apples to oranges, or it's, yeah, it's not even comparing apples to oranges. It's like these these are complementary. This is a meal. You know, uh, like why would you eat? only one when you can have the meal together like you could do an exercise you could do again like the, the study was six sets like most people would program three sets of squats three sets of hip thrusts move on to other exercises leg press lunges whatever the fuck else because all that's going to come out now is another study that compares lunges to uh hip thrusts and all of a sudden we're going to see like oh lunges are better than hip thrusts or fucking some random research some random exercise they're going to be like oh let's compare glute bridges to hip thrusts it's like this this who cares about if this is a better exercise for a general population over this exercise because all we really care about is having exercise tools in our toolbox to target a muscle group it's the same stuff that came out when we have all this emg data and realistically it's like this means nothing like look at the study it's like okay this, this study shows this after this period of time but it's like okay well can these people progressively overload their squats continuously after this? And you're like, mm, no, they're not. They got up to whatever. I can't remember what they fucking increased their one RM on the squat walls. But we'll just say that there. Then again, they get less results from that. Less results, less results in terms of your ability to overload it. But they were able to progressively overload their hip thrusts for six months, eight months, two years, four years, five years. And I was like, that's really what we want to do. We want to progressively overload over years. And if a certain exercise beats that over years, unreal, that's great. Perfect for you, keep at it, you know? That doesn't mean that you just say, never squats anymore, no deadlifts, no whatever. It's like, what, like, you're, you're a multi-directional, multi-muscle, multi-movement capacity human. Why are you going to limit yourself to only one exercise for the rest of your life? It doesn't make sense. Nope, it doesn't. So yeah, basically, if you see any dichotomous opinions online on this, just realize that it doesn't fucking matter. Um, at the end of the day, these are just exercises. They're just a choice. Like, yeah, if you have people that are being very dichotomous and they start saying never hip thrust or never squat or never deadlift or anything like that, or if they start making claims that they're like, this is the best exercise for this and like you have never done that exercise and you still have great results at the end of the day it doesn't fucking matter because again it's all just made up all these exercises made up irrelevant just completely made up
Yeah. Like, could you imagine? Well, actually, the same thing does happen with this, I guess. But like, people being like, "Oh, should I do continuous cardio or hit? Like, which is better?" It's like wrong question, bad question. You know, like that. That that's the exact same thing. But imagine if it was like a a, a jujitsu study, right? There's a jujitsu study. It's like a what? Uh, should you do arm bars or triangles? You're just like, like clearly, you're just like what? What? what that that's dumb. You know, that's just a dumb question. And it's kind of the same thing here, like squats versus hip thrusts. That's not to say. The study does not have value, but it's the hot takes that we would kind of take issue with. But yeah, that is that is that for this episode. You know, if you are interested in getting more informed on the training process, you have a number of different options. If you're interested in, you know, one to one, you want me and Patty to just like design your program. You want to see what all this stuff looks like on paper in the real world, what it feels like. You don't want to just be doing all right, let's do one exercise once a week. Like clearly that's not what you want to do. We can help you out with that one-to-one online coaching or group online coaching, which is actually the cheaper option. If you just want to get a little taster, you want some support, but you don't quite need all of the specifics, then that could be a good option for you. Um, yeah, the the group program- person, I, mean, I would view it as like, you want to just outsource things without having to check in with someone all the time. Like you don't need very specific guidance. You do well with more generalized guidance that we, you know, we do tailor it to you in the group, you know, like we do weekly check-ins, that kind of stuff, um, uh, conference calls with those. But yeah, I would see the group coaching as basically people that just want to outsource their, their training. They don't want to think about this stuff, but they also don't want to pay uh, the money to do one-to-one or they don't want to be in a place where it's like oh i have to check in with someone every single week or i have to do this you know so yeah yeah and like you can still get all your training analyzed you send in your videos we'll you know analyze all your videos give you feedback make some tweaks to your technique so there's still a good element of personalization in it so it is a good cost effective solution if you want to take even a further step back and you're like right i just kind of want to get the broad principles in place i'd like to have a program that you know has some reasoning behind it and i can tweak it then the beginner's guidebook or the program templates are a good option you know they're pretty cheap but they're just like designed to be like right here's what everything looks like um in a very general sense and here's the education that you need to kind of start to make some decisions so they're a good show too um and then after that it would be great if you could support us in some way by keeping up with the content so if you want to keep up with the newsletter then you can subscribe to that below. That goes out every Sunday. There's content in that that does not get released anywhere else on social media. So if you want to read, you know, an interesting article, you want recommended resources and you want to keep up with the content that we've posted throughout the week, then that's a good place to to keep up with us. Um, You could also join the Triage Method community. And that's our free Facebook group. We have great discussions in there. People post in their questions. We post in, again, posts that will not go anywhere else on social media. So good place to keep up. And then you can follow our other YouTube, for example, YouTube channel, videos go up there, exercise library, the podcast also goes up there. And then you can follow our other social media channels, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all at Triage Method. And and yeah, that's that's pretty much everything. Yeah, I have nothing else to add to that. Um, I would definitely subscribe to the newsletter because that just keeps you up to date with everything. Um, and the Facebook group, 100%, get your ass in there. So again, even if you're thinking like, oh, well, I don't want to, I don't need to buy coaching. I don't need to do group coaching. I don't need their, their eBooks. I don't need any of that. But I would like to be able to ask questions. I would like to be able to get feedback on my training, et cetera. Or you're just like, I want to be in a discussion group, forum, whatever you want to call it. Um, then the Facebook group is, is for you. Anyway, we're going to wrap it up here. As we say every week, it is literally too easy. And we will see you again on Monday.